So may I introduce you all? My name is David Wood. Uh, I'm Emeritus Professor of Cardiology at uh, uh, the National Heart and Lung Institute, uh, Imperial College uh, London, and I'm part of the leadership of the Global Coalition for Circulatory Health. The number of uh, COVID-19 cases has now passed 10 million worldwide, uh, with over 500,000 uh, deaths. The highest numbers of deaths in the USA, in Brazil, and in my own country, the United Kingdom. The Global Coalition uh, was formed at a World Heart Federation Global Summit in Singapore in 2017. And we invited the leaders of all of the international organizations with a stake in circulatory health to come together. And for what purpose? To advocate uh, on behalf of our patients for better prevention and control uh, of all circulatory diseases. To WHO, to the UN and other agencies, speaking uh, as one uh, voice. COVID-19 highlights the interdependence of our specialties given the disproportionate impact uh, that this virus has had on patients with stroke, with hypertension, with diabetes and other comorbidities. There is a real need now, uh, more than ever, for our specialties to work uh, together uh, through our Global Coalition for Circulatory Health. Today, we have a distinguished panel of leaders uh, from several of the international organizations that are members of the Global Coalition who will bring their knowledge and expertise on how we can fight COVID-19 in people uh, with circulatory diseases. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Mark uh, Fisher, uh, he is Professor of Urology at Harvard Medical School uh, and the President-elect of the World Stroke Organization, one of the founding members of the Global Coalition. And he's going to talk about stroke and COVID-19. Mark. Thank you for the introduction, uh, David. Uh, uh, so I'd like to welcome everybody who's on the call. And uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of uh, COVID-19 and stroke. Uh, we're first going to talk about potential mechanisms, uh, then we'll talk about the impact COVID-19 has had on inpatient and outpatient care, and lastly, some recommendations uh, that have been made to uh, stroke services. Uh, so the potential relationships between COVID-19 uh, and stroke, as well as cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease, are outlined here. And they basically, basically relate to um, the effects of the virus in people with cardiovascular risk factors uh, and decreased physiological reserve. Uh, I'm not going to go over the mechanisms of COVID-19 infection uh, and how that relates to the angiotensin uh, II receptor and also the TMPRSS2 uh, system. Uh, there's been some discussion about a hypercoagulable state, especially in younger stroke patients. Coagulation abnormalities uh, and inflammatory responses uh, have clearly been demonstrated with the infection. So there's sepsis-induced coagulopathy. Uh, we've seen patients who've developed antiphospholipid antibodies, which are procoagulant. Uh, lupus anticoagulant is a related factor. And then the hyperinflammatory state from the cytokine storm can induce hyperviscosity, which can affect uh, coagulation. Another potential mechanism for uh, COVID-19 related stroke is embolic stroke. So we know that um, COVID-19 can induce arrhythmias, can induce cardiac injury, acute MI and uh, plaque from plaque instability. And then, as I mentioned, um, the sepsis can um, lead to a catecholamine storm and dysregulation of the particular system. And lastly, endocarditis, a secondary infection. 
Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit now about the impact of COVID-19 on, on inpatient stroke care. Um, I did a, a, a study with people in China where the pandemic first started, and this paper is in the, in the, um, the June issue of Stroke. Um, and what we did was we looked at two data sets in China. One was a big data observatory platform from 280 hospitals across China. And then secondly, um, we sent out a survey which was returned by uh, 225 hospitals in China of what their experience was uh, with uh, stroke admissions and acute treatment. And um, so what you can see here is we compared February 2019 and February 2020, uh, and there was uh, a quite significant drop uh, in, the, in, the, in the percentage of acute stroke patients that were admitted uh, to these hospitals, and also um, about a 25 or so percent decrease in thrombolysis and a 23 percent decrease in thrombectomy. Um, unfortunately, a lot of this slide I can't see it. I'm not sure I remember exactly what's on here. Uh, so you can you can see on this slide also that there were effects on various aspects of stroke patient care and also on uh, stroke education. And then uh, we also looked at factors um, which affected um, presentation to the hospital uh, and reasons as to why thrombolysis and thrombectomy uh, were deeper. But one of the important uh, reasons uh, was that patients were afraid to come to the hospital. And there were many hospitals in China that became uh, COVID-19 only hospitals. And so their ability to take care of other conditions was impeded. Uh, so the conclusions of that study were that the COVID-19 outbreak had a significant effect on inpatient uh, stroke care in China, uh, resulting in a significant decrease in admission, thrombectomy, and thrombolysis. And the major reason was patient fear of, of coming to the hospital. Uh, this has also been seen in other countries. So the World Stroke Organization, what we did was we sent out a um, survey to our membership. Uh, we, we got a little over 100 responses from 45 different countries. This was done in the latter part of um, April uh, when the in, when the uh, pandemic was at its height in Europe and in some parts of the US. And so the bottom line, on, if you look at where it says all countries, uh, the mean decrease in stroke admissions was uh, 42%. There were a small percentage of centers which had no decrease. And then in the ones that did, there was a wide range of uh, percent decrease, but the average was a little over 40%. Uh, we also asked the respondents about change in outpatient clinics, and uh, a small percentage of them said there was no change. Uh, another small percentage uh, said that they weren't seeing any outpatients at all, but the great majority uh, were doing outpatients, uh, mostly by telehealth, which uh, in in different circumstances was video, telephone, or both. And I can tell you that at my center in Boston, uh, we stopped doing uh, in-person outpatient visits in the middle of March, and I was doing new patients by video uh, if the patients could get onto the site, and most follow-up patients by telephone. Uh, from one large center in uh, Shanghai, you can see on this slide, um, this is outpatient visits to the neurology clinic, of which more than half were stroke related. So there was a dramatic decrease in February, but then it started to come back in March, April, and May, and is getting closer in May uh, to the historical average. 
Uh, and then the last thing I want to mention are um, some of the guidelines that have appeared in the literature, and I'm quoting from papers in Stroke. Uh, so this came from the Stroke Council in the United States, and uh, the, the audience can see some of the recommendations that uh, the Stroke Council made. And then uh, another paper we published in Stroke uh, outlined um, what, what was called protected code stroke. So what that means is that when the inpatient team was called to a stroke patient in the emergency room uh, or in um, the hospital, uh, they had to um, put in place a number of uh, features to protect themselves uh, and the patients. And there's two slides, this one, and the next one, again, you guys can read it because unfortunately I can't read it to you. Uh, and the goals here were to reduce the number of medical personnel exposed to the patient um, and to protect those medical personnel as much as possible, obviously with appropriate PPE. Uh, and so um, the evidence-based recommendations are outlined on this slide, and again, on the audience can easily see what the recommendations are. And we'll let the next person take over. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mark. I'm sorry you had such uh, technical difficulties, particularly given your uh, recent data on stroke from uh, from China, which is very pertinent to to our subject. But anyway. Now let me introduce Dr. Anna Lola, uh, who is a cardiologist specializing in heart failure, uh, based at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, where she is director of heart failure research. Uh, she is going to address myocardial injury, myocarditis, and COVID-19. Over to you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here today. I am privileged to be speaking about a very important topic, myocardial injury and COVID-19. So over the next 10 minutes, I'd like to cover four major points. The definition of myocardial injury, the mechanism, its prevalence, and its subsequent impact on outcomes. So first with the definition. I think it's critically important when we think about myocardial injury to go back to the basics. And this is a nice schematic that comes up from the fourth universal definition of MI, where we see that increased troponin is essentially what is representing myocardial injury. Now, the causes of that can be many, but I think it's really important to come back to this um, structure and schematic of how we think about myocardial injury, whether it's in the context of another disease or in this case, COVID-19. And when we're talking about it in this context, we're really talking about the acute myocardial injury. So troponin rise and fall, be it with acute ischemia or without ischemia. So let's move on to the mechanism, which is the billion dollar cap, uh, question. So this is a little uh, cartoon we put together for a review that's uh, hopefully coming out in Jack soon. But uh, we know there are a variety of mechanisms whereby myocardial injury can take place. There's oxygen supply demand imbalance by virtue of the actual illness. There's inflammation related injury. There can be stress induced coronary plaque rupture. There is micro and macro vascular thrombosis, as we just heard. There have been cases of stress-induced cardiomyopathy. But really what everyone's wondering is, is there direct viral myocardial invasion by SARS-CoV-2? So let's think a little bit about that definition. COVID-19 myocarditis diagnosis requires A, a clinical presentation, which we've seen in a number of reports, and histologic findings, including inflammatory lymphomonocytic infiltrates and myocardial or myocyte rather necrosis, not typical of ischemic injury, SARS-CoV-2 genome in the heart tissue, viral particles in cardiomyocytes, 
and exclusion of other known cardiotropic viruses like enterovirus or parvovirus. SARS-CoV-2, as far as we know, is not a cardiotropic virus. And lastly, I'll just mention that just because we see a troponin elevation doesn't mean that a patient has myocarditis if ischemia has been ruled out. So this is a busy sky slide, I apologize, but I show it just to show the fact that there have been a number of reports, both autopsies and case reports, some of which have biopsies, some of which don't, that have attempted to show myocardial involvement on a histologic basis. So there's a 12-person autopsy report from Germany, which showed one patient who had lymphocytic infiltrates, uh, but no myocyte necrosis, but there was a SARS-CoV-2 genome in the myocardium, and that's in the right ventricle, you can see here on the right. Um, there are a number of other autopsy studies, three patients from uh, Chongqing, one from Beijing, two from Oklahoma in the United States, three from New Orleans in the United States, 11 from Austria, and seven from New York. All of these autopsy studies had varying forms of the previous criteria mentioned on the last slide. And then these case reports to the right that you can see were largely sensationalized, especially early on in the pandemic. But several of them had no biopsy to show histologic evidence of myocarditis. One that was published in the European Heart Journal showed a positive uh, biopsy, but no SARS-CoV-2 detected uh, in the myocardium. And this patient presented with reverse Takotsubo's disease. And then the last one here I'll highlight was published in the European Journal of Heart Failure, where SARS-CoV-2 was seen in macrophages, but not in myocytes. And this is the figure represented here on the right. So what does this mean? Really, that further evidence, both autopsy and biopsy, are required to confirm the causal relationship between SARS-CoV-2 and myocarditis. What about thrombosis? We heard a little bit about that in the previous talk. There have been a number of reports showing that uh, venous and arterial thrombosis appears to be common, potentially up to 30% of inpatients, particularly ICU patients. Uh, we've seen strokes in young patients. Um, frequent post-mortem findings of pulmonary emboli um, and multivessel microthrombi. And our personal experience at Mount Sinai of 26 sequential autopsies showed thrombosis that was not expected pre-mortem in 11 of 26 patients. So what about the prevalence of myocardial injury? Well, this is a study that we uh, just published in Jack. It's uh, of nearly 3,000 hospitalized patients throughout the Mount Sinai health system. A diverse population, a quarter of them African-American, 27% identifying themselves as Hispanic or Latino. A quarter of the population had a history of cardiovascular disease, including atrial fibrillation or heart failure or coronary artery disease. And then another 25% had risk factors of either hypertension or diabetes. Accordingly, nearly a quarter of the population were on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, and over a third of the population were on statins. So in this study, we found that over a third of the population, 36% to be specific, had evidence of myocardial injury with essentially elevated troponin concentrations. But as you can see here from this graph, the levels of troponin elevations were, marked, were low, really, you're seeing a majority of these under 0.25 nanograms per milliliter. And this is a high sensitivity troponin. And in the previous slide, you can see that patients with a history of cardiovascular disease had higher troponin than those patients without a history of cardiovascular disease. And so what is the impact of this finding? Well, what we saw is that those patients with elevated troponin levels, and you can see they're divided here in three groups, patients with normal level troponins on the left, mildly elevated troponin, 0.03 to 0.09 in the middle, and then greater than 0.09 on the right. And you can see that the green represents patients who were still hospitalized at the time of this publication. The blue represents those patients who were discharged, and the red represents those patients who died. And those patients with more elevated troponins had higher rates of mortality and less frequent discharge. 
This is also shown in terms of survival Kaplan-Meier curves. And those patients without troponin elevation were associated with better survival. Those patients with troponin elevations of over three times the upper limit of normal were associated with up to a three-fold increased hazard of death. And I point this slide out because I think it's interesting to note that it seems that the troponin elevation was more prognostically important, or at least associated with the outcome of death, regardless of whether there was a history of cardiovascular disease or risk factors of diabetes and hypertension, in that the relationship of those patients who had elevated troponins was greater than threefold association risk of death, regardless of the history of cardiovascular disease or hypertension or diabetes. So it was really the troponin elevation that had the prognostic association. And this was despite taking multiple factors into account. So what are the take home points to, to finish quickly? One, I think it's critically important for us to go back to the basics. When we see a troponin elevation, recognize that that represents myocardial injury, and then think about critically what the underlying mechanism could be, rather than jumping to the fact that this, this may be a acute myocarditis caused by SARS-CoV-2. I would say that to date, reports showing this are rare, and more information is needed to really demonstrate that causal relationship. Thrombosis may be an important complication. The prevalence of myocardial injury seems to be common in up to one third or maybe even a little bit more of hospitalized patients, but these levels of troponin elevation seem to be low. And finally, the impact of troponin elevation or myocardial injury seems to be a marker of worse prognosis independent of other factors, including cardiovascular disease. I want to thank the organizers and uh, the attendees for uh, your attention. I apologize for some technical difficulties. I wish uh, everyone uh, good health to stay strong and to stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. We will get better and better at coping with these technical difficulties as we conduct our lives uh, virtually. So now it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Peter, uh, Peter Libby. Distinguished Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and a cardiovascular specialist at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in uh, Boston. And he is the president-elect uh, of the International Atherosclerosis Society and is going to address uh, cardiovascular complications of COVID-19. Peter. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, my talk is really very complimentary to uh, Dr. Lala's, uh, so I'm going to be able to hopefully get us back on time. These are my competing interests. I do not accept any personal payment from pharma, but I uh, do have a uh, relationship with a biotechnology company that doesn't have any products on sale yet. Uh, so I'm going to continue the theme of cardiovascular complications of COVID-19. And we've already heard about the, the prevalence and the prognostic implications. These early data really very uh, concordant with the later data that Dr. Lala showed, shared with us, uh, that it looks like about a third of the patients who are hospitalized will have evidence of acute cardiac injury. Um, some will have evidence of heart failure and shock, sepsis, and arrhythmias can also complicate uh, this disease. And it was appreciated even early on in the Wuhan experience that there was an increase in venous thromboembolic events. But as we've heard from Dr. Fisher and others, uh, there is also arterial thrombosis. We know that uh, the acute cardiac injury portends worse outcome. We just saw a recent uh, data from New York experience from Dr. Lala. Um, Basically, uh, if you have a higher troponin, you're in worse trouble from a prognostic perspective. And those that have a sunnier prognosis, uh, as shown on the right side of panel A there, uh, have um, lower troponin levels. COVID-19 uh, causes of death incorporate a huge number of individuals with myocardial damage. Uh, myocardial damage and heart failure is shown in the pale green. 
uh, combined with respiratory failure in the yellow. Uh, so this is a big chunk of the pie of uh, fatalities as uh, causa mortis in this disease. So it seems like at least a third of the hospitalized patients with COVID-19 have evidence of myocardial injury, and that's from the early experience through to the most recent data we just shared. Uh, what are the mechanisms? And again, my thinking is very much aligned with Dr. Lala's. There is the possibility of a direct cytopathic effect and then indirect effects. We've already heard about the direct cytopathic effect. Uh, we saw similar data in Dr. Lala's talk. Let me just add that um, a couple of both Chinese and Boston as yet unpublished uh, single cell messenger RNA sequencing data suggests that it is the pericytes, those cells that invest the microvasculature, so muscle-like cells in the microvasculature of the myocardium that express very high levels of the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 isoform that is the receptor by which uh, the SARS-CoV-2 enters cells to cause its uh, cytopathic effect. Now, the indirect effects, uh, I agree with Dr. Lala, probably predominate. And to review them in context, I'd like you to think about the endothelial cell, which is one of the only surfaces, either synthetic or natural, that can maintain blood in a liquid state during prolonged contact. And the homeostatic functions of the endothelial cell include a variety of anticoagulant mechanisms as shown on the left and prothrombotic uh, that can be elicited when the endothelial cell senses danger. There's also uh, involvement of fibrinolysis, endogenous fibrinolytic system, UPA and TPA, uh, and an endogenous inhibitor, the plasminogen activator inhibitor, uh, that can be released under times of stress as mediated by pro-inflammatory signals. So I've been interested in this problem for a very long time. You can see 1989, uh, when actually cardiologists were not interested in inflammation, I was invited to give a talk at a meeting on septic shock and put together this rather primitive diagram with the original MacPaint program, uh, saying that when we have a mediator of a danger signal, uh, from an infectious agent, in this case, gram-negative endotoxin, because the topic was septic shock, it can elicit a first wave of pro-inflammatory cytokines that can tip that balance on the surface of the endothelial cell, vitiating uh, the homeostatic properties, anticoagulant, thrombolytic, and antithrombotic, and boosting the procoagulant, antifibrinolytic, and prothrombotic balance. And this slide is, is strikingly similar to contemporary thinking and relevant to the disease that we're speaking about today. As shown by this recent paper in the New England Journal uh, that was a consortium that included um, one of my colleagues at the Brigham, Dr. Menser, uh, that showed evidence for pulmonary vascular endothelial inflammation and thrombosis and, and also uh, through RNA sequencing, uh, signs of angiogenesis. And here we see intravascular thrombosis in those microvessels the very microvessels that are invested by those pericytes. Uh, so we have very good evidence for small vessel thrombosis. And we also saw, uh, I think even the same pictures uh, um, showing uh, DVT and pulmonary emboli with pulmonary infarction as a all too common complication of this disease as we heard. So, the thrombosis, the heightened clot accumulation, the thrombosis and the defect in thrombolysis affects not just larger arteries, not just the veins, but also the microvessels. And the finding of COVID toes probably represents microvascular thrombosis and microvascular thrombosis undoubtedly contributes to some of that myocardial injury and that of other organs such as the kidney and the liver as well. So as I say, I've been interested in this uh, interface between infectious agents and atherosclerosis for a long time. I chaired a uh, working group of the NIH and published way back in uh, 1997 uh, this uh, assessment of the evidence. And we've had a couple of follow-on meetings that we called 3I for infection, uh, immunity, and inflammation. And uh, in Jack, just a few years ago, we reviewed this topic again and 
I'd like you to consider that remote infections, for example, uh, a pneumonitis, such as a profound bilateral uh, pneumonitis that we have with COVID-19, um, that it can evoke inflammatory echoes in the prepared soil of the atheroma. And that can promote plaque rupture and prompt a type 1 myocardial infarction. Uh, so the messengers that are released in response to the local inflammation can evoke this echo at the level of the preformed atherosclerotic lesion. This probably explains some of the predisposition to worsened outcomes in those with pre-existing disease. And then we also heard from Dr. Lala about the imbalance between oxygen supply and demand. When a patient has a severe infectious uh, challenge, tachycardian fever will increase the oxygen requirements of the myocardium, but hypotension and hypoxemia, which of course is very prevalent in hospitalized patients with COVID-19, can cause decreased oxygen supply. So we have a perfect storm for causing myocardial ischemia, and that is a setup for the type 2 MI, going back to the universal definition that Dr. Lala showed in her first slide. So there are a number of mechanisms of these cardiovascular complications. I just spoke about the imbalance between supply and demand, the accelerated atherosclerosis due to direct infection or the echo, vascular dysfunction, including vasomotor dysfunction that neither of us spoke of, but that undoubtedly can contribute in the late stages of disease, and then the thrombotic diathesis with an imbalance between the coagulant and the uh, fibrinolytic systems. And I agree completely uh, with Dr. Lala that the bookend case of fulminant viral myocarditis shown on the left of this diagram is probably relatively uncommon, whereas the type 2 or type 1 myocardial infarction are uh, probably part of the, the cause of the troponin leaks in myocardial injury, uh, including microvascular rather than macrovascular dysfunction. And of course, there are going to be some cases that are in the middle ground here. Um, so I'd like to, to finish by just considering cytokine storm, because this uh, is something that is central to my own personal research over more than three decades. Seems like I spent my career preparing for this disease. Um, some of our colleagues put together this uh, schema of the time course of COVID-19, the early viral phase, viremia, then the pulmonary phase, and then the hyperinflation phase, uh, which can lead to that cytokine storm that we heard about from both previous speakers. As the New York Times uh, put it very early in April, a cytokine storm is when patients are betrayed by their own immune system, and it uh, can unleash all of these dysfunctions of the endothelium and other organs that are important in the pathogenesis of the disease. Cytokines are protein mediators of inflammation and immunity, and they're essential in our host defenses that can be turned against us when they're overexpressed. And there's also positive feedback loops, and some of this work um, came back from work that uh, I did in my laboratory and in collaboration with Charles DiNarello back in the 1980s. Um, so advanced COVID-19 cytokine storm can contribute to the multi-organ system failure. The amplification loops are when we have that initial pathogen-related stimulus, uh, could be endotoxin in the case of a bacterial disease, but certainly the virus and its, uh, and its products as well, can lead to induction of pro-inflammatory cytokines we worked out the auto-induction of interleukin-1 in uh, early work in the 1980s and showed in my laboratory that IL-1 is a strong inducer of IL-6, which then goes to the hepatocyte and turns on the acute phase response that we measure as CRP, but that causally can increase fibrinogen, the precursor of clots, and that inhibitor of our endogenous clot-busting system, uh, PI-1. And we know from many, many studies, these are some of the early ones, that interleukin-6, which is the mediator of that hepatic acute phase response, is increased in patients who have severe disease with COVID-19. And that those who have the higher interleukin-6s have worse prognosis um, in terms of needing 
ventilation. This is German data that's coordinate with the worldwide experience. Now, uh, we don't have time to go into therapeutics. Uh, there are all kinds of different management strategies that have been proposed, antivirals, anti-inflammatories, anticoagulants, all under study. But we have a problem. Um, last night, I accessed the clinicaltrials.gov and found uh, over 2,300 trials that were registered. You might think that this is a good thing, but I think it actually is a uh, frustration to our system. And as Rob Califf and his colleagues pointed out, we really need to improve our research infrastructure and get together rather than having a bunch of uncontrolled or poorly controlled or unrandomized small studies, which are going to generate very unstable data. We need to coalesce and have consortia that will make uh, this problem, bring it into focus with uh, strong, rigorous data rather than the scare or hope of the day, which is what we've seen with the plethora of these very small studies. So I urge you to read and consider this um, editorial that was written by our colleagues, uh, led by Rob Kaler. So in summary, the landscape is rapidly evolving. There's a lot to learn. We have to also address the very important uh, social disparities that in my country, in my hospital, uh, are very serious and point to societal issues that we really need to get together to address. This is not just all biology. Uh, part of the rampage of this disease has to do with our failure to have uh, equitable access to resources. And I favor this kind of symposium which brings together multinational organizations to organize collaborative efforts to support rigorous and randomized observations, because that's the only way that we're going to move forward in therapeutics. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. And I should remind our audience that we are open to uh, questions. You just need to submit your questions online, and we will have a question and answer session hosted by Dr. Pablo Perel towards the end of this webinar. And now it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Gianfranco Parati, uh, who is a full professor in cardiovascular medicine at the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery, University of Milan. Uh, he has served in several uh, distinguished leadership roles in the field of hypertension and is representing uh, the World Hypertension League today. And he's going to discuss management of hypertension, ACE inhibitors, and COVID-19 outcomes. Jim Frank. Thank you for the introduction. Hypertension, as you know, is extremely prevalent in the world. And when we discuss a condition such as the COVID-19, we need to face this problem. You know, these are just the numbers of June 29, more than 10 million people affected by this disease in the world. And more unfortunately than 500,000 people dying has not finished yet. We also know that uh, the virus infection itself might downregulate the ACE2 expression, which in a way might favor an excessive production of angiotensin 2, which might damage the lungs as well. I hope you can see the slide this time. <laughs> this is just a list of guidelines and recommendations that were published by different societies in the world, all in agreement with one point, that there is no evidence that taking ACE inhibitors or ARBs might damage the patients, at least based on clinical studies. This is the statement from the WHL that was providing some very practical recommendation to our patients. I hope you can see this. And they were just concluding that there is, at the time of the publication, no evidence that people with hypertension have a greater risk of infection with COVID or worse complications. Point number two, no evidence that any type of medication to treat hypertension might favor COVID-19 and change the severity of the disease itself. They were also providing very practical indication, such as continuing, obviously, taking the antihypertensive pills, measuring blood pressure at home, obviously, keep hydrated and, of course, doing some physical activity indoor, if possible, just to help also the cardiovascular system in a way. Some patients were indeed identified as being a higher risk. 
and this includes the elderly people, mainly with comorbidities, the presence of previous heart condition or stroke, as you already been listening before, or kidney disease, diabetes or high cholesterol, and any chronic uh, respiratory disease, including smoking. What were the data then that were published? These were the recommendations provided based on a kind of theoretical background, but we also now have data from studies. This is a paper from our university. It was published in the New England Journal in May 1st. It's based on the administrative data of our region, Lombardy, including more than 6,000 patients. And this study was investigating the occurrence of a possible relationship between the disease itself and having on treatment ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or other antihypertensive agents. And the conclusion was that based at least on these administrative data, there was no link between any antihypertensive treatment and the prevalence and severity of COVID-19. These are the odds ratio for ACE inhibitors, ARBs, CCBs, diuretics or beta blockers. And you see there was really no association with either mild, moderate or fatal disease due to the virus infection. These are administrative data, as I said, not clinical data, but quite clear uh, in underlying this situation. Of course, we also have some clinical data. That's another paper published in the same issue of the journal, May 1st. These are data from people tested for COVID-19 among whom there were some uh, entering a severe disease. And again, there was no evidence in this study on a large sample, more than 12,000 people, of any association between taking antihypertensive agents and having a more severe disease. And also data were published later, that's a paper published in Circulation Research, concerning mortality. And as you can see here, in hypertensive patients affected by COVID-19, if anything, there was a lower mortality rate when they were taking ACE inhibitors and ARBs as compared to those who were not taking these uh, drug classes. A small group, not a big sample, but quite clear, at least in highlighting a difference in prognosis. The second issue, completely different, but still important in itself, during the pandemic, we could not take care of our chronic patients as well as we did before. This was due to many factors. Hypertension centers and clinics were closed. There was a reduced people mobility due to the uh, pandemic and the uh, need for the government to uh, provide protection to the population. Difficulties in having diagnostic tests scheduled and performed. And all our specialists were sent to the front line. Even in my hospital, everybody was turning into a COVID doctor for a few months because there was a great need of doctors active and people sick were too many all the, at the same time. And we had to face also the effects of stress. The situation was not really relaxing. There was also a change in many cardiovascular parameters due to this situation. Certainly there was a need to maintain a link with the patients in spite of this difficult situation. We need to reassure them on the safety of their treatment to prevent them from stopping uh, taking their pills, need of counseling and empowerment in their daily management. And obviously, this was highlighting the importance of telemonitoring, teletransmission, and home blood pressure combined with telemonitoring and teleconsultation, which is not a new solution, obviously, but became more and more important in those days, highlighting the importance of digital health and mobile health. That was one of the systems we developed in my hospital on our website. You might go and very easily book a visit through the system, which was scheduled at specific times and days with a uh, doctor you might choose to follow your situation at home. And we combine this with use of a mobile health solution. This is the ESH Care app that we developed with the support of the European Society of Hypertension and the Italian Society of Hypertension, a very simple app. You can download it also in US, it's free, that can help storing the values and some anthropometric data, linking to the doctor, so you can have a feedback for your physician when you send in their blood pressure, heart rate, or whatever information you wish. Get some education, 
providing very simple teaching how to face situation changing in daily life, but also collecting some data, uh, what I call a kind of street epidemiology, if you want, for research, highlighting and identifying also the role of the uh, hypertension center in the uh, field. So telemedicine did actually show to be effective and was really helpful in improving the efficiency and quality of care in those difficult days, also reducing some demands on patients in a way, but also the cost of care, because it was very easy to organize this teleconsultation with a very low cost and of the low price as well. And this was in the same time reducing the spread of infection. This might be useful in the future again, also with a more common influenza if you want, but even in case we, maybe not, but we might see again this virus coming back. So that was a very important lesson we learned by fighting this virus. That's a wall painting by an artist in Milano. He's just facing the windows of my hospital. It was a big thank you from the citizens of our city to the doctors and nurses fighting this virus, but also finding a way to provide care even in the difficult days. That's the Milan skyline. We had very dark days. You may remember the news, you know, as you also have seen in the US, in Brazil now, people were really worried and uh, quite depressed. Now we see some light again. So situation is improving, but we have to be careful because the vi virus is still there. And you have to keep our attention focused on importance of preventing another spread and controlling the cardiovascular complications that have been discussed so nicely by my colleagues during this webinar. The World Hypertension League is fighting hypertension continuously. We have postponed the World Hypertension Day, which is usually on May 17, so it will be on October 17 this year, and you are welcome to join this initiative to favor knowledge and awareness about hypertension to keep measuring blood pressure to reduce the cardiovascular risk associated with hypertension even after this terrible pandemic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gianfranco, uh, for your presentation uh, and memories of uh, Milan in darker days, but now uh, the light is beginning to shine through. Uh, we are open for uh, questions and answers, and I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Pablo Perel, who is the Chief Scientific Officer for uh, the World Heart Federation, who is going to host this part uh, of the webinar. Pablo. Thank you, David. Maybe uh, uh, to um, Dr. Parati, um, you mentioned uh, about the, the use of telemedicine and, and technology uh, in Italy. I mean, do you think that certain things, they, 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 they came to stay? So even if they were developed for tackling uh, the COVID-19 situation, they will change the practice? Um, and also, how feasible are some of these solutions for some of the regions that are now suffering COVID-19, like uh, uh, Latin America or, or Africa, settings where they have um, less resources to, to implement those solutions? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Thank you. As you know, telemedicine is not new. We have been doing research in this field over the last 17 years. So, But telemedicine was always a uh, using the frame of a research project, which means you have a study, you have a budget, you support telemedicine. When the study is over, the money is over, telemedicine is over in many situations because there is no support from the healthcare system. So the big challenge coming from this COVID-19 pandemic is to change the healthcare policies to provide also some reimbursement, and some support for telemedicine. Technology is there. But the feasibility depends on how this can be introduced in the management of healthcare in the different system in different countries. Uh, you mentioned uh, other countries, maybe in Latin America or Asia, they are facing now this situation where the healthcare system can be quite different. And this is indeed the, the challenge, finding a way that technology may become a clinical tool for daily use. We have a project running now, we have call it charge up. Charge means China, Argentina. So we are comparing Buenos Aires and Shanghai to see in two completely different cultural environments, how this approach using a smartphone app with a mobile connection might help improving hypertension control. So I don't have now an answer 
for your question, but we are studying this in practice. Uh, theoretically, we believe this is feasible and possible, but there is a strong need for collaboration with the government and the healthcare system. As we did for home blood pressure, remember that even in US was quite difficult in the past, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Now, some of these technology are reimbursed, but others are not, and which may be a problem for their uh, diffusion. Thank you. Can COVID um, accelerate previous atromatous uh, lesion uh, like, yeah, so basically development of um, atherosclerosis, um, if COVID infection can, can, um, yeah, can, can uh, accelerate uh, atherosclerosis Dr. Lala Krindeid, are you are you there? Yeah, yeah like sure. Can you hear me? To ask? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. So I, I think um, it's an interesting question. Clearly, as Dr. Libby beautifully illustrated, there is a great deal of endothelial dysfunction that we are seeing as a result of this disease. Whether it causes long-term effects in terms of development of atherosclerosis, I think remains to be seen. Uh, in the acute setting, there has been some speculation that stress and inflammation and endothelial dysfunction may potentially lead to acute plaque rupture in those patients with pre-existing coronary disease. But as to whether it causes atherosclerosis de novo, I don't think that there's any evidence to support that as of yet. I think it's an important point to make here, though, however, that we will need, God willing, we're able to overcome this acute phase of the illness and get a handle on things, but we will need to follow these patients longitudinally. And uh, myself and other colleagues in New York have already um, put plans in the works in terms of grants, et cetera, to really develop a center of excellence uh, in New York at least, to follow these patients longitudinally via imaging, via laboratory markers, to understand what the long-term repercussions of this illness are. Excellent, and I think that, that links with a a question that I had, it was understanding the long-term impact, and it's great that you are doing that. And I think uh, I would like also to mention, and as uh, David said, I, I work for WHF. WHF is doing a global study on uh, COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. These are um, hospitalized patients, but it will include patients from all around the world. So hopefully we can build from that study also to, to have data from all around the world. I think there's a, a last question, if I, if I may, David, for um Dr. Fisher, that they ask which type of stroke predominates in COVID-19 patients? So it looks like the, um, the type of stroke that's directly related to COVID-19 is embolic uh, from all the various mechanisms that I showed and the other speaker showed uh, because of the um, risk of clot formation especially in younger patients. So it looks like it's embolic stress. So th thank you, Pablo, and my thanks to all of uh, my colleagues uh, for their excellent uh, presentations uh, today. Um, the world is changing before our eyes politically and socially and economically, and uh, the recent decision of the Trump administration to stop funding uh, WHO uh, is a matter for profound uh, regret uh, at a time when global unity uh, and a shared common purpose is more important uh, than ever. And the Global Coalition for Circulatory Health uh, and all of its members signed a letter uh, in support uh, of the World Health Organization uh, and appealing uh, to the US government to uh, withdraw uh, its decision uh, to stop funding uh, WHO um, at this critical time. So on behalf of all of my colleagues in the Global Coalition for Circulatory Health, thank you for joining uh, this webinar on COVID-19. Uh, we have the third in our series of webinars uh, in uh, July, and we look forward to welcoming you back on that occasion. Thank you for joining today. <laughs>